Royce O'Neal is one of the most frustrating players I've ever watched. Now, he's no James Johnson or TLC. If you're a Nets fan, you know they were just straight awful. But Royce has the ability to go from complete spud to an absolute baller within 10 seconds. The guy's hit a number of clutch shots in some big wins this season, but he's also provided some of the most brain-dead moments I've seen from a basketball player. If you've watched Nets games religiously, you understand. If not, while well, today's video is looking at Royce's performance against Minnesota, which I think perfectly captured this to a T, and we'll back it up with his performance against Denver. So you should be educated by the end. Royce's performance at Minnesota, I'd say, was largely positive. He played the last 17 minutes of the game, which included time without a backup five, as he filled in for Nick Claxton, who fouled out at the two minute mark of regulation. In 36 valuable minutes, he had three threes and three free throws made on his way to 12 points, had a season high 15 rebounds with three of those offensive and three steals. Against Denver, he racked up three more threes, scored 11, had six boards and four dimes. But his defense, especially on Nikola Jokic, was some of the most courageous and inspirational I've seen this season. But whilst these analytics provide a surface level understanding, let's watch some film to get a full grasp of Royce O'Neal as a player. Now, some of Royce's defense in this game was spectacular. The biggest thing that sticks out to me was how he held his own tremendously against much bigger bodies in Rudy Gobert and Nikola Jokic. He limited the amount of touches they got in the paint where they'd be easily able to get a high percentage look, and he was incredibly physical with them. I felt this was more apparent against Jokic and definitely more impressive as he picked up his fifth foul at around the 9-14 mark in the last. He never shied away from playing the same physical defense he'd played all game and showed an incredible amount of discipline for a guy who's guarding someone significantly bigger than them. This was all capped off with the final couple of possessions where he forced Jokic into first a mid-range with the help of Spencer Dinwiddie and then to force him into a fadeaway three which held a large level of difficulty. A huge amount of respect for a courageous effort in this department. Had it not been for Royce being crappy on defense, I don't think he would have displayed the inspirational showings against the Minnesota and Denver bigs, because Jacques Vaughn wouldn't have sprung that assignment onto him and made that adjustment. But Royce standing six foot four and described as a versatile wing would make you think he can guard guards. No. Far from it, actually. He usually gets bypassed way too easily, and that was apparent more so against Minnesota. Mike Conley and Anthony Edwards, the two that exploited this most. Far too many times, drives would be on offer whenever Royce had to guard on an isolation possession. Pretty frustrating, especially when we can't get stops. Now, when Royce shoots the three ball well, the Nets play well. In 13 games this season where we hit 16 threes or more, we're 12 and 1. Well, how does this stat relate to Royce? Well, when you've got a bunch of 3 and D wings on the roster, they all need to deliver on the shooting front to reach that 16 three-pointer mark. In both games, we did hit 16 threes. And in those two games combined, Royce scored six on 50% shooting. There's plenty of three-point looks on offer, so Royce knocking them down presents itself as a problem for defensive units, but also provides a bit of relief. As the shot clock winds down sometimes, Royce beats the buzzer or scores very late into the shot clock. That's important when you've got shooters who can make the best out of a bad offensive possession. That said, when there's plenty of three point looks on offer and Royce can't make them, then we have an issue and it's so frustrating to watch. Let's pay attention to some of Royce's worst three-point games this season. Two of eight, lost to Dallas. Two of eight, lost to Boston. O of eight, lost to Chicago. One and five, losses to Phoenix and Detroit. That's just some examples. And this was when he was posting 30 plus minutes most games. Hence why he's been so frustrating to watch because of the importance of him knocking down threes and failing to reach expectations, especially in games that we've just said here. Royce is seriously capable of facilitating. There's been lob passes, there's been passes to open the court up and get shooters open, there's been passes which help push the pace and get us open looks with the opposition failing to organize, but that's where it ends. 
Royce is seriously incapable of facilitating. Sometimes he just fails to know what he even wants to do with it. Sometimes he gets lost in two minds. Sometimes he goes for a pass that's clearly not on. That just happens way too frequently for my liking. Royce never fails to hustle. He's always in passing lanes. He usually brings the physicality when boxing out and he isn't afraid to put his body on the line if it means he can get a vital touch to benefit his team. This one here in Denver was vital. Spencer turns it over, but a vital hand in by Royce means the shot clock expires as opposed to turning it over in a spot which is very tough to recover from defensively. This one here came at a time when we were getting absolutely spit roasted in the back end of the second quarter. Royce recovers once after Macau loses it, then from a long rebound gets a hand in there. And if you're a believer in miracles, well, now you've got proof of it because somehow after a ghastly possession where we can't buy a bucket, we've still ended up with it when it's all said and done. Royce seriously teases us with his hustle. This Minnesota game captured a sequence I've seen way too many times. A crap ton of offensive rebounds which result in nothingness. Like one offensive rebound, okay, easier said than done. The second, surely you get it to go. The third, now there's no excuses. The fourth, come on now. Like the hustle's good, but the effort and the outcome don't match, which is infuriating some of the time. Royce's IQ has been on display numerous times in a positive light. I thought I'd use a few plays to describe it. Royce, when he can see the team's offense is stagnant, he's pretty proactive in getting something going. Like this Minnesota possession where we're on a run, 11 seconds left on the shot clock. Nothing's been done in the first 13 seconds. Joe starts the ripple by driving towards the middle and opening the, the court up. Royce grabs the ball which has been thrown behind him, which is easier said than done when you're running full pelt. Spence is open. McDaniels is late to the closeout, which means Anthony Edwards must block the drive. And Royce is open in the corner. Royce changing the direction and flinging the ball back to where we were was underrated, challenging Minnesota to remain awake. And he kept our run going by hitting the three. Here in this play, Royce with the block, and then the understanding to flag that McDaniels is on five fouls. He drives it and he gets the foul. We now know that it was overturned, but if the outcome remains unchanged, that's not only a huge four point swing by Royce in the short term, but it also holds power in dictating the complexion of the game in the long term, because we know that McDaniels is Minnesota's best defender. I love this play from the Denver game. We've made a huge third quarter run and are looking to continue. Running a 2-3 zone, KCP swings it to the opposite wing. But Spence, knowing the pass to KCP is now incredibly tough to execute, now can peel off and pick up Gordon on the baseline. Royce now loose and not having a direct assignment in the immediate future becomes that defender that blocks the bounce pass that MPJ is looking for. And with so many bodies having trapped him in an awkward spot and having picked up his dribble, means he feels a bit rushed. DFS moving laterally, anticipating where the bailout pass is headed, helps as the ball is sent skyward over Bruce Brown's head, forcing another turnover. But Royce blocking off the safer pass and a cohesive defensive system in this situation helped tremendously in moving the ledge up further to our advantage. Sometimes Royce does some of the dumbest shit. Once Cam Johnson turns the ball over here, I'd concede a layup, but Royce makes a big error. Falling for the pump fake, I don't know what he's trying to do here, but the minute he makes contact, he is granted an easy opportunity for an N1. Gobert's hands are like a vice, so unless you actually tackle the bloke to the floor, you've made the wrong play at a big stage of the game. I'm not even capping, but the very next possession, all he needed to do was bring the ball past half court and then get into a set. Nothing complicated, but he's looking for Macau before he bypasses halfway. McDaniels picks him up and he commits a carry because he realizes the pass wasn't on. Like to have one lapse is ridiculous, but to do it again, watching that is the bane of my existence. And in this game, we know how the last shot went down. All we needed to do was stop the three. The initial switch before the inbounds was fine, but Royce stays attached far too long to Anthony Edwards when Doe rightfully should have switched onto him. And so whilst Nas Reed is approaching the inbounder to catch the pass, Royce is still backtracking and will need to become balanced and push off that back leg 
to match Reed's run. Too bad that those extra milliseconds he stayed on Ant were the decisive factor. And Nas Reed essentially has an open view, top of the key, exactly where he wants it, and we're in overtime. Overall, you can see that Royce does everything in his power to get you excited about what he can contribute, only for him to shoot that thought down in 15 seconds when he does something despicable. Generally speaking, he's been pretty darn good when he's good, but the inconsistency has been present, and when he's bad, it's bordering on sabotage. It's going to be interesting to see what role he has to play with this Nets team, especially when there's more to play for as we close in on and enter the postseason. Hope you enjoyed. Make sure to drop a like and subscribe if you're new for more Nets analysis and watch-alongs. Let's get this small Nets community we got here expanding and growing into an interesting phase of this Nets chapter. Thanks for your time. Have a good one, and bye for now.